We're so happy you're all here tonight, and we are all thrilled that Dennis Prager is here tonight. The Jewish Republican Alliance always likes to honor our veterans. Are there any veterans in the room? If there are, please stand. event from KADY TV, Mr. Bob Allen. Thank you, Bob. At, at, at all of our Jewish Republican Alliance events and all our literature, we always mention that we are taking a stand for America and Israel. And now, Now to honor America and Israel, will everyone please stand as Cantor Alicia Pierce will sing the national anthem and honor Israel with the Israeli national anthem, Hatikva. Please join me. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the Oh 
also here, conservative leader, activist, singer, TV host, model, the multi-talented Joy Villa. Joy just had Mitch and I on her podcast, and then I was on TV with her. I don't know if you saw it. Joy hosted uh, uh, the Daily Ledger show on One America News, and she had me on. So thank you, Joy. She was a main viewer of it. Also in attendance, my daughter, conservative daughter, Trip. Well, well, all my kids are conservative, actually. Owner of TLK Multimedia, she's been doing photography and video for us. She's pretty, she's successful, she's conservative, and she's single. <laughs> On behalf of the JRA Board of Directors, a heartfelt thank you to all of our sponsors for their generosity and support to help making this evening possible. Thank you all. A big thank you to all of our volunteers. They checked you in rather smoothly, it seems, and we filled the house, so thank you all for all your hard work. A very special thank you to someone I truly admire, Dennis is producer, executive director of Prager University, and it was helped to make this evening possible the amazing Mr. Alan Estrin. We have some of our community leaders here. San Fernando Valley community leader, Mr. Mark Widower is here. Orange County leaders S. Harris Pinsky and Maggie Flam are here. <laughs> Howard Weisenfeld from our Canaille Valley chapter. Howard. <laughs> and one more big thank you to all the people who have supported us, helped us, given their time, their energy, their devotion. To all of you, we are so very grateful. We started out with 18 people in the back room of an Agora Hills restaurant. And now, the Jewish Republican Alliance has filled one of the largest temples west of the Mississippi with the leading conservative thinker in America, Dennis Prager. You all want to hear Dennis, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to co founder Mitch Silverman. Mitch? Okay, how's everyone doing? So, this is going to be the interactive part of the evening. It's going to show a hand as many times as you want. How many of you here for primarily for Dennis Prager? Well, my daughter raised her hand, that's why you're here. And how many of you are here to be amongst fellow conservatives? Wow, that's good. How many of you are here to support your temple or have an open mind and hear something new? That's great. Okay. And how many of you aren't going to raise your hand no matter what I ask? Ah, gotcha. Okay, great. Well, whatever your reason for being here, if you're Republican, we're thrilled you're here. If you're Democrat, we're thrilled you're here. If you're Independent, we're thrilled you're here. If you're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, atheist, Mormon, we are thrilled. You're always welcome at JRA events. So thank you for being here. So, you guys feel the energy in the room? Yeah, you do. You feel maybe a little bit inspired? Okay. Well, it reminds me of someone that had a big impact on me when I was growing up, Zig Ziglar. Do you remember him? He was, yeah. He was an author and a motivational speaker. And one of his uh, famous sayings was, I am so optimistic, I'd go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with me, okay? <laughs> and people would say to him, you know, Zig, this, this motivational stuff, this inspirational stuff, it doesn't last. And he had an epic response. Well, neither does bathing, which is why I recommend both daily. <laughs> so my question is, what can you do to capture this energy? What can you do to stay inspired? 
Because we have a big Tuesday coming up real soon, don't we? Has anyone other than me ever yelled at the TV set while watching the news? Anyone ever throw the newspaper down in frustration? Okay, well, we, now is the time for action. We need more than that now. Because now more than ever, conservative activism is needed. So I ask you, what can you do? Well, for starters, you're here tonight. Coming to events like this is very, very important. You can join substantial organizations like, I don't know, JewishRepublicanAlliance.org, okay? You could read books from great JRE speakers, such as Exodus, the Rational Bible. It's just superb. If you haven't got it, please get it. There's another great JRE speaker, Evan Sayed, who wrote a very important book, The Kindergarten of Eden. Great book. Better yet, buy the book and give it to someone who doesn't share your points of view. Okay? You can also write letters to the editors, like I did last week regarding Judge Justice Kavanaugh. Okay? You can uh, get people registered to vote. You can vote. You can contact your congressmen and women and senators. You have to do something because now, more than ever, conservative activism is needed. And I'll share a very quick inspirational story. My wife Stephanie and I, three weeks ago, or a few weeks ago, we dropped off our oldest of three kids at that bastion of conservatism, University of Oregon. <laughs> and on the way back, we stopped for three and a half days at a dude ranch in a small town with a population of about 200 people. So I'm going to tell you a very quick story about people that I find very inspiring, Doug and Heidi. We got to know them over those three and a half days. Doug and Heidi own and operate that dude ranch for the last 25 years. To me, they are the fabric of what makes America great. Because they are deeply religious, they love God, they fear God, they are hardworking, they're owners, they're entrepreneurs, they are employers, uh, very hardworking, pay a lot of money in taxes, they're deeply religious, they're, they're devout Mormons, they are fiercely independent. They don't want a government that has their back, they want a government that's off their back. Okay? And you know what? They deeply love America. And guess what other country they deeply love? Take a wild guess. Israel! They do. When they found out Stephanie and I are Jewish Republicans, take a wild guess the first question they asked us. What would it, would it be? Why are so many Jews Democrats? So we had a conversation about that. They're lovely people. We shared our thoughts and observations. But you know what? The Jewish Republican Alliance is helping to change that. It really is. And the other discussion we have with Doug and Heidi is our, our awe of the country. The founding of the country, the brilliance of the founders, the importance of the First Amendment, the importance of the Second Amendment. Where they lived, they were a good 24, hour, 24 hours away from police help. So, Heidi said to me, why wouldn't I protect myself? I have to, there's no one here to protect me from four-legged predators, like bears and mountain lions, and two-legged predators called bad guys, okay? They believe in protecting themselves, and we realize that America is really an experiment. It's an idea, un, unhappy, you know, it's never happened before in, in world history. And this idea is a story that's unfolding before our very eyes. And for this story to have a successful outcome or successful continuation, it needs heroes. To me, people like Doug and Heidi are heroes for the way they live, for the, the way that they approach their fellow man, the way that they care about the land, people, family, religion. That, that's what makes up the greatness of America. So the story of America needs heroes, and I submit to you, a lot of the heroes are in the audience tonight. Because America needs heroes, right? Because now more than ever, conservative activism is needed. The Jewish Republican Alliance exists to unite and energize conservatives to take action on behalf of America and Israel. And as Dennis is fond of saying, we, only, we need fighters, and we, know that we need those who support fighters. So I encourage you to join the movement, get involved, and join tonight. Thank you. And now I have the distinct honor of introducing Representative Elton Gallagher. Proud to say he's been to our home before. He's hiding behind the side of the here. Sorry, Elton. Uh, he has a, an amazingly tall and impressive resume, so I had to keep it a little bit brief. Elton Gallagher served from January 3rd of 87 until January 3rd of 2013, completing 13 terms of service in the U.S. House of Representatives. He's actually the longest serving congressional representative in Ventura County history and served with five presidents. He was instrumental in advocating for the passage of a major NATO expansion of legislation throughout Europe, the Balkans, and the Baltics, and he represented the United States at the 2002 summit in Prague. He
He chaired one of the first hearings on the 9-11 Commission's recommendations as chair of the Subcommittee on International Terror Terrorism, Nonproliferation, and Human Rights, and wrote legislation to impede the international travel of terrorists. It's a true hero, true patriot. Since I have known Elton, he has always been a staunch supporter of Israel and always a friend to Jewish Republicans. He was a passionate advocate for his constituents in Ventura County and served them for over 26 years. He and his wife, Janice, of 44 years, made quite the team and take pride in their four children and 10 grandchildren. So introduce our guest speaker. Please welcome Elton Gallagher. Wow, thank you very much, Mitch. This is kind of a humbling occasion for me, looking out. Uh, we have a lot to be excited about and proud about right now. Uh, and to be in a room full, wall to wall, but no empty seats, with people on a very similar mission. What a great evening this is. And none of this would have been possible had it not been for Bruce and Mitch and Judy and Stephanie. I think And they've done all of this in basically just a little over two years. And I think this is going to catch on across the country because these young leaders uh, are so committed. And tonight is a, a great indication of how successful that commitment has been. Sold out. Wow. And, and of course, it's a humbling time for me as well to be here with Dennis Prager. You know, um, when I was asked to come this evening, I why, why do you want me? You know, uh, we. Uh, I'm just one of these old white guys. <laughs> but. I'm retired, but I'm not dead. You know, the first time I had the honor of meeting Dennis Prager, Dennis you probably don't even remember, it was almost 40 years ago. Almost 40 years ago. I remember clearly I was only four years old. <laughs> I'm afraid that math doesn't work out. That would mean that you weren't here yet. But in any event, no, it was a noontime rotary meeting in the city of Simi Valley, and I'd just been the newly elected, first elected mayor in the city of Simi Valley in 1980. Today, Dennis's life has changed a little bit from 40 years ago. He's uh, on a daily radio show with 2 million listeners. And, and these aren't people that just tune in the radio. Trust me, as you all know, these are truly listeners. We need a few more listeners these days than we do uh, some of the alternatives. Dennis is known around the world uh, for his lectures, almost every corner of the world. He's also a recognized author, and of course his latest book, bestseller book is uh, titled The Rational Bible. just came out, what, in the spring or early summer? He is also known by far the largest producer and distributor of non-liberal video. I almost said non-violent, but... <laughs> But violent liberals, there is a similarity there uh, uh, with the, that content in the world. Through Dennis Prager's university, a virtual university. Let's hear it for the... You know, I'm, I'm not much of a techie, but I'm learning, uh, doing no small part, to the internet method of communicating through Dennis's 
a university where he's had already over 600 million hits. You know, you didn't come to hear me, but I have to convey to you that I've had the honor of over 33 years of public life to be with some pretty special people. As uh, Bruce had said, uh, uh, five presidents. But uh, I have had no higher honor than having the, uh, the opportunity to introduce Dennis Mormonly tonight to all of you. Dennis is not only one of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life, and next to Ronald Reagan, he stands as a great communicator. So I have to say it is my high, my highest honor to introduce to you a person that you will enjoy every word and hang on every word that he says. A person that I have great respect for, and I'm honored to call him a friend, Dennis Prager. comment on something that Congressman Gallagher mentioned. I moved uh, to California in 1976 in my uh, 20s and I moved to uh, Simi Valley because I was brought out here to, by the late great Dr. Shlomo Bardeen to succeed him as the head of the then Brandeis Institute and then Brandeis Bardeen Institute. <coughs> to the dismay of the board, I might add. <laughs> Its own, its own issue, but they couldn't say no to Shlomo Bardeen in any event. The first thing I did was join the Rotary Club. I was the only Jew in the club, if I'm not mistaken. This is Simi Valley, 1976. Not a, not a hub of Yiddish type. And uh, it had a lasting impact on me. I. It's, uh, it chokes me up, actually. I get choked up a lot when these things happen. Uh, I fell in love with America. That's why I'm choking up. Give me a second. And uh, that, was the, uh, that was sort of the beginning of my falling in love with America. I'm a yeshiva boy, and the, the world revolved around the Jews and Judaism and Torah all of my years till I was 18. And I realized when I was a 20 that I loved this country. I didn't realize it as a kid. And then I joined this Rotary Club, and it was very... Uh, it was very moving to me that it was completely irrelevant to them that I was a Jew. They weren't, it didn't mean anything, do you understand? Uh, and the, you see, this is the great tragedy, and I'm, I'm going to use that word a few times tonight because of the Jewish tragedy of embracing leftism. It is, it's a tragedy. It's, it's, there's no, I mean, I have worse words, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> But it, 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 it's a, at, at the root of leftism is ingratitude. It is its single most profound characteristic. 
and it's the most disgusting characteristic in human life. To be ungrateful to live in the greatest country humans have ever made is disgusting. I know from having been abroad so much in my life, and by the age of 26, I think that's what I was when I was here, I had already been to about 30 countries, and it was everywhere on earth. It didn't matter. Not, not even West Europe, even pro progressive West Europe. A Jew in France is a Jew. A Jew in England is a Jew. A Jew in America is an American. You see, I didn't even plan to say this, but when the congressman mentioned Simi Valley, and then I thought the Simi Valley Rotary Club, it was so profound to me. If I were in the Simi, if I were in the Paris Rotary Club, I'm not saying they would have been anti-Semitic. I don't believe they would have. But I would have been, it would have been Denis le Juif. That is the Jew. You are the Jew, the Jew, the Jew, the Jew. The black, the black, the black, the Turk, the Turk, the Turk. Third generation Turks in Germany are Turks. They may not even speak Turkish. They may only know German, and they're still a Turk. First generation Turk in America is an American. There is no place on earth of where that is true. And the left has the audacity, the chutzpah, the arrogance, the idiocy to call this country xenophobic. It is the least xenophobic country in the history of mankind. There is no parallel in history of people living in a good place and tearing it down. There is no parallel to what the left is doing to Western civilization generally and to the United States specifically. And let me make something clear as I do every single day. I divide between left and liberal. Alan Dershowitz is a liberal, said to me, it is in the film you will see next year that Adam Carolla and I are making no safe spaces. On film, in his apartment, to me, I, as an American, a liberal, a Democrat, and a Jew, far more fear the left than the right. Any liberal who does not fear the left more than the right is a sweet, well-intentioned fool. That's the fact. That is a sad fact. I am sorry. It includes people I love, and I mean it, I love. You can be a lovable fool. You can be so foolish as to let the bad guys win. The left is the enemy of liberalism, and Alan Dershowitz is the quintessential liberal who understands that. If you don't understand that, it means you don't want to understand it. It is so obvious. Okay, that was just silly about. So I had a few names that I wanted, to, uh, nearly every name that I wanted to mention was already mentioned uh, by uh, the wonderful Mitch and Bruce. God bless them, God bless the Jewish Republican Alliance. Thank you Rabbi Feinstein for having us here at your synagogue. By the way, talking about that, would you stand up if you're a member of Valley Beth Shalom? Wait, I want to welcome you. Only as a, as a good thing, I would love to speak for the whole congregation one day. But that uh, I just want to throw that. By the way, the the Republican candidate for Congress from this district. I met him earlier. I'd like Dr. Ken Wright to please stand. Up.
it's a mitzvah to elect him. <laughs> mitzvah has two meanings, by the way, as those of you who know your Hebrew know. It means good deed is the most common translation, but it also means commandment. Because one can leave it at that. So, <laughs> commandment to elect him. So, uh, of course, Alan, my, my co-founder of Prager University was mentioned to you, Marissa Strike, the CEO of uh, Prager University. <laughs> Larry Greenfield was mentioned, so I won't mention him. Don't even think I mentioned him. I have nothing to say about him. I just wanted to make sure he was mentioned. <laughs> So let me tell you, I, I, you have no idea, I, I, I give a lot of speeches. Uh, I will be speaking about five times a week for the next two months. And that's not radio, that's beside radio. But this speech was very special to me. Because of the, uh, I have sadness, this is not a, it's not a happy speech. And I know it's being uh, videoed, so I want to make clear to anyone watching, I'm speaking Jew to Jew. I know there are, of course, non-Jews here. They're obviously needless to say welcome. But I'm really speaking Jew to Jew in this speech. And I, I, I can't tell you, I, there, are no, there really aren't words, and I'm, I'm good at words, but there aren't the words to describe my deep disappointment in so many of my fellow American Jews for being on the left, not for being liberal, but for being leftists. When I would read that there were many synagogues around this country that sat shiva, that went into Jewish mourning when Donald Trump was elected president, <laughs> let me put it to you this way, having just completed 500 page commentary on Exodus. When God wanted to destroy the Jews, and I learned about it in yeshiva, I wasn't on God's side. This is a joke. <laughs> I don't want to destroy the Jews. I'm just telling you, I never understood how you could get so angry at the Jewish people, even God. I'm angry at my fellow Jews who are on the left. You are not only hurting America, you are hurting Jews. And I, 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 and it has been a lifetime of trying to understand how do people side with those who want to hurt them. There is no parallel on earth for a Jew to be on the left is like a, a black being for apartheid. It, it, it's, were there any blacks who, who went around the world supporting the South African regime? I don't think so. And if they did, we would think, these are very strange people. <laughs> How does a Jew support the left? The this, this, this seat of Jew hatred on earth today? How do you do that? Are you stupid? What is, what is wrong with you? It is it's perplexing. The Jews of England may leave England if Corbyn is elected to the next Prime Minister. Do you understand how bad it is? How do you support the left if you're a Jew? What is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you? By the way, there is no easy answer to it. Because it's unique. There is no example in the history of the world of a group siding with those who wish them ill. There is no example. I debated the head. It's so, so the rock is so deep. I debated the head of the Jewish Studies <coughs> Department of UCLA at UCLA some years ago. And the subject was, is there a moral difference between the Palestinians and the Israelis? And he said there isn't, and I said there is. The head of Jewish Studies at UCLA. The same UCLA Department of Jewish Studies invited, uh, what's his name, the, uh, the, 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 I'll tell you, I have it down here, Cornell West. Cornell West is, is supports BDS. 
and they invited him to give the keynote lecture on Abraham Joshua Heschel. There is, do you understand? It, you, can't, you can't imagine. I can give you anecdote after anecdote of Jews supporting people who loathe them. Now, I don't say Cornell West loathes all Jews. You know the old line, oh, well, I'm only anti-Israel, I'm not anti-Jewish. So, so wait, so you support the economic strangulation of one state on earth, the Jewish state, the state inside of New, uh, size of New Jersey, but Jews are not supposed to see you as an enemy. Let me ask, I always, I have said this for 30 years, if somebody said, you know, I really love Italians, but I, I would like to strangle Italy. <laughs> right, you would laugh, wouldn't you? But we're supposed to take seriously the moral idiocy. I love Jews, it's only Israel I love. Please, please. That's the Jewish state, okay? And here's another thing for American Jews. In the history of the word chutzpah, this, this is chutzpah exponentially greater than chutzpah. There, no, I don't know the word. I don't know. English and Hebrew don't have the word for American Jews having the audacity to tell Israel how to think. There is an unbelievable audacity. The arrogance of the left has no limitations. I am an American Jew living in the safety of this, of this phenomenal country, seven, ten thousand miles from you. Your children are on the line in, at Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, and, and, and Gaza, and I'm telling you how to vote. I know better. So if you vote for Netanyahu, you stink, and now there's this great rift between American Jewry and Israel. You know what? Israelis know better about what is good for Israel than you do. Netanyahu's policies. Well, let me tell you something. They elected him. And if they elect the left-wing prime minister, this conservative will support him just as much as I support Netanyahu. Because this American Jew thinks what is good for Israel, not what is right and what is left. What? I have one task as a non-Israeli Jew. Protect Israel. That's it. It's a level of arrogance, the likes of which is truly unparalleled in, in, in my study, lifelong study of history. American Jews and claim about, oh, we're having a rift with Israel, the, uh, the younger generation isn't identifying. Maybe it's because you, on the left, poisoned the younger generation. Okay? Guess what? Jewish kids are not born anti-Zionist. They're taught how to be anti-Zionist. They're taught to think they know better for Israel than Israelis do. I supported Yitzhak Rabin on the left. I, I adored him. I supported him. I, by the way, many right-wing Jews thought I was out of my mind. I even supported Oslo. If Israel does it, I'm okay with it, even if I disagree with it. I can make Aliyah in one non-stop flight from L.A. to Tel Aviv, and then I am an Israeli citizen that day. So if I don't choose to do that, I can simply say, how can I help you? That is the only question an American Jew should ask any Israeli prime minister. They sat shiva. American synagogue sat shiva. The the the. the Mourning ceremony for the, the, the death 
of an immediate relative was used and perverted and sullied and dirtied by non-Orthodox synagogues around this country who had the audacity to take a Jewish ritual where you sit for your child, God forbid, or your parent, or your brother, or your husband, or your wife, and did it because Donald Trump was elected. Did they sit shiva for one Israeli slaughtered during any of the intifadas? No! Because they're leftists before they're Jews. Just as Catholic leftists, not just Jews, leftism is the most dynamic religion in the world of the last 100 years. Catholic leftists are leftists before Catholic, Protestant Catholic, Protestant leftists are leftists before Protestant, and Jewish leftists are leftists before Jew. They may not feel it. They may think Judaism and leftism are the same. The Pope thinks Catholicism and leftism are the same. The Presbyterian Church USA, which passed a BDS resolution, thinks that Protestantism and, and leftism are the same. It's the poison of leftism in Jewish life and in non-Jewish life that could lead people to think this way. It is, it, it, to sit shiva, there was a rabbi, shockingly, in Berkeley, who, uh, <laughs> who, are you ready? Fasted. He fasted. Did he fast for one of the Americans who died on 9-11? Did he fast for one of the thousands of Israelis slaughtered? Did he fast? I mean, he fasted because Donald Trump won the election? How, how stupid can you get? How, no, no, how arrogant. It is it's showmanship. Look at how pure I am. Look at how wonderful I am. I am, I am fasting because a man I don't like became president. So here's something I tell the left every day on my radio show. This is, this is news to them. Guess what? We didn't like Barack Obama as much as we don't like Donald Trump. They can't imagine that. They, they're, they're like children. They're, they're, the narcissi narcissism and leftism are synonymous. The world revolves around my feelings. They can't imagine. You know why they can't imagine that we were as disgusted with Barack Obama's presidency as they are with Donald Trump's presidency? Because we act civilly when we're disgusted and they don't. And because we, we didn't close bridges and didn't close tunnels and didn't smash windows and didn't break down businesses and didn't surround Democrats in their restaurant seatings. They didn't understand we were just as disgusted with the worst president possibly in American history. We are simply not conservatives are nicer than leftists. Not than liberals, but than, than leftists. We are. We just don't do what they do. But they're infantile. So they act out. They smash. We didn't have a majority on the Supreme Court since I'm born. And that is a while ago. And let me tell you, we don't bang on the Supreme Court doors. Nor do we check your high school records. I swear, as I stand, that's why I'm wearing a kippah. I'm standing in front, in front of Sifrei Torah, scrolls of the Torah. So that is how holy my words are, I am about to say. If there had been the identical equivalent, let us say Merrick Garland were in fact nominated and his, and his case taken up, his nomination taken up, and some woman came a week before the nomination who said he did whatever and whatever to me in high school, I would have had the identical reaction. That is not how America conducts 
the way it evaluates a judge of the United States Supreme Court. That is it. I don't know if she's lying. How can I know? But that's the whole point. Since there's nothing to know, why was it taken up? It was taken up to smear a good man. And that in Judaism is a sin. When I, I've been on radio for 35 years. I was on during the Clinton year, the entire Clinton era. I made an announcement regularly. There will be no Monica Lewinsky jokes on my show. If you start to tell me one, I will hang up on you, and you will never hear one from me. It's all recorded. You can hear me say it. And I said why, because I cite Judaism frequently on my radio show. And non-Jews love it. It's the Jews who have a problem with it. <laughs> Whoever humiliates someone in public, it is as if you have shed his blood. That is what, that is the epitaph for the Democratic Party of the last two weeks. They have shed the blood of an innocent man. That's all they did. We are told in typical moral idiocy of the left, believe women. That is an amazing statement. Believe women, not believe evidence. Believe truth. Believe women. You are not embarrassed to make such a claim. What do you think of someone who said believe men? Are you joking? That's what I would say. I don't believe men, and I don't believe women. I believe evidence. That is all there is to it. The reduction of all values to race, gender, and class is one of the ways in which the left is destroying the West. And by the way, you know, it's so funny. They get angry when I say this. But they say it. They say what they want to destroy. Barack Obama, five days before he ran in 2008, announced, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. I don't want to fundamentally transform the best country that has ever been. It is, you, you quote them to them, and they still don't know what they said. Oh, we on the left love America, but we want to fundamentally transform it. Let me just ask those of you married. In fact, even better, those of you divorced. <laughs> what do you think of the notion that, that your spouse would like to fundamentally transform you? <laughs> is, let me just ask you, is that a sign of love? I'm just curious. Just curious. I don't know. What do I know? I've been divorced, been married. I, what do I know? But I, I've got to tell you, it sounds to me bad. <laughs> It's not the most loving. My wife said, oh, honey, I love you, and I, I hope somehow you're fundamentally transformed. <laughs> I would think that there was a... Uh, in Kimura, is the astira, a contradiction between those two ideas. Oh, we love America. Oh, so it's sexist, intolerant, xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, racist, and bigoted, and we want to fundamentally transform it, but we love it. <laughs> You love like that? You don't need enemies. <laughs> what love? What a sick love. They're not even honest with themselves. Of course you don't love America. You crap on it every day. That's your essence. It's the essence of it. It's a racist country. The pre President Obama said it. It's got racism in its DNA. And then they called Trump divisive. The audacity, the chutzpah, the idiocy. Was that city in Missouri with the uh, Ferguson. Ferguson? How often did President uh, Obama mention Ferguson? You know how what a lie? That's a sheer lie. A jury consisting of a lot of blacks acquitted the, the, the policeman. There was no racism whatsoever. 
His life was ruined. I feel bad for the kid, but the kid attacked the policeman. That's the fact. That's a fact. It's not a CNN fact. It's not a New York Times fact, but it's a fact. <laughs> But this president, he's divisive. He's divisive. Right. So let's talk about Donald Trump for a moment. I'll talk to you. For the record, as of this moment of this speech at this time, this president has been a great president. He was my last choice of 17 Republicans. And no, no, it's not funny. I, I must say, this past Yom Kippur, I wrote him a note asking for Slicha for forgiveness. I fell into the trap of hearing some stupid comments and making. My conclusion based on that. He said stupid things. You're right. So let me talk about saying stupid things. None of us have ever done that, but I just want to, I to analyze. For example, the famous Planet Hollywood tape that was released about growing. Okay, so here's the story. And I learned this in Yeshiva. That's where I got most of my wisdom. If you believe I have any wisdom, that's where I got it. What people say privately says nothing about them. That's the way it works. There are two things that let me know your character. What you say publicly and how you behave. Yes. It is not the thought that counts, but the deed. This was drilled into me. Judaism is a behaviorist religion. It says you give 10% to charity. If your heart isn't in it, doesn't matter. <laughs> That's Judaism, okay? That's the way it is. Your heart is, you don't want to fast Yom Kippur? Too bad, Charlie. You're supposed to fast on Yom Kippur. That's Judaism is behavioral. Maybe one day your heart will catch up, but Judaism is not interested in your heart. It tells you over and over not to trust the heart. If I judge people by what they said privately, there is no good person on earth. None. That is simple as that, okay? Just for what I have said to, about other drivers would put me in hell. Whatever race, ethnicity, religion, or gender a slow driver in the left lane is, I hate that group like the biggest bigot in America. If I see a Jew with a yarmulke going slowly in the left lane, I'm anti-Semitic. <laughs> How about this? David McCullough in his great biography of Truman notes that when Truman went to visit New York for the first time, he wrote back how many kites he saw. <laughs> Harry Truman is the man who recognized Israel against the entire advice of the State Department. Which, which, but if, if Jews were as stupid then as they are today, they would have somehow learned. The guy used the term kite privately, we can't vote for him. And they would have lost the greatest advocate they had when Israel was found. I don't care what people say privately. It tells me nothing. He said, if you're famous, you can grope. They let you grope them. Didn't say he did it. And if he said he did it, he was probably lying. 
he was having a fun with another guy in a, in a totally silly way. That's all it means. That's, you get it? That's all it means. Unless you went to graduate school and you got so stupid you don't understand what I just said. So yes, I opposed him during uh, his, Mc his McCain comment was totally beyond the pale. I mean, absolutely, I, I agree. I agree. People are packages. What he has done as president is so unbelievable. My wife and I had the honor of having dinner with Vice President Pence and his wife in their home. Just for <laughs> Five guests there, the five guests and three Trump, of three Pences, the, the parents and one of their daughters. And uh, he, he told us it was quite remarkable the opposition he had to moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. <laughs> the, 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 uh, he told us, uh, well, I'll tell you what I can tell you. He told us world leaders just stood in line, as it were calling him, begging him not to do it, and warning him the Arab world will explode if he doesn't. And then he did it, and there was no explosion. One of his virtues which comes with some of his flaws. But the virtues are more important is he doesn't give a damn what people say about him. He is completely not intimidatable. World leaders call him up, tell him not to do it. He thanks them, has a tootsie roll, and then does what he wants. You know, in a certain sense, Donald Trump, who, by the way, I believe is an extremely bright man, okay? Yeah. Extremely bright. But Donald Trump, Donald Trump, there's a certain beautiful simplicity to the man. He says, wait a minute, didn't every president promise to move the embassy? Republican and Democrat, every presidential candidate and president? Wait, and, and, and didn't Congress pass a resolution? to move the embassy. So, okay, I'll do what every past presidential candidate does. And, and, and what the Congress resolved to do? What's the big deal? So what is the big deal? And by the way, did you know this? Did you know the Conservative Party of Canada has now on record it will move the Canadian embassy if they are elected? And do you know why? Here's the answer. Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> that is the only reason. Oh, it really annoys the New York Times. He goes and tells our allies, uh, excuse me, you should be paying for your defense. <laughs> what is exactly wrong with that idea? Why is that alienating our friends? If they're friends, they should not be mooching off us to defend themselves. <laughs> then there is my favorite critic, critique, like the Pope, a moral giant if there ever was one. <laughs> said, we should be building bridges, not walls. That is only meaningful if you went to graduate school. <laughs> By the way, I'm only half jesting because I did go to graduate school, but, 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 I dropped out. I dropped out. <laughs> After two years, I realized, I don't know why I'm here. I, I, so anyway, but uh, I'm only half jesting because this is very serious. And this is truly a big reason Jews are on the left. It's not the only reason. Jews are the best educated ethnic group in the United States. The more highly educated you are, 
the more of a fool you are. <laughs> it is not true for everyone, it is true in most cases. When someone says something morally stupid to me on my radio show, I then ask, I let them fit, you know, I have never yelled at a caller in 35 years, okay? I am known for being polite. So I politely ask, I'm curious, what college did you go to? <laughs> to which they will say, well, why do you ask? I said, because you had to go to college to say something that silly. <laughs> and I mean it sincerely, and I don't blame them, I blame their higher education. You have to have a higher education to believe these things. To believe we need to build bridges, not walls, or to compare the wall to the Berlin Wall? Didn't the Berlin Wall keep people in? How do you make, because they're both spelled with a W? Is that, I, it's breathtaking, the idiocy of that comment. It's breathtaking. There's a very simple reason for the division on immigration, and it has zero zero to do with xenophobia, zero. It has to do with the belief that the nation state is a good thing or not a good thing. That's all it is about. The left has, since Marx, the left has never divided the world among nations. It has divided the world among classes. That is a very major belief on the left. The nation is a bad idea. That's what the left believes. The nation is a bad idea. If you listen to my program regularly, you know that on many occasions I have noted that a few years ago in the Superman comic strip, Superman stood in front of the United Nations and gave up his American citizenship to be a citizen of the world. Left-wing writers have taken over Superman. The original writers were super-duper Jewish patriots. Jews in the 30s were crazy about America. Jews in the 40s were crazy about America. Jews in the 50s were crazy about America. Jews in the 60s became leftists. That's what happened. Jews made the films that celebrated the flag. Jews made the films that, were, that loved the word patriot and loved the symbols of patriotism, like the flag. Would you like to compare how many flags there are uh, up in, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi versus Santa Monica, California? <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean let's, so, so they'll say, well, that's not a sign of patriotism, that's just a, that's just a piece of cloth. Okay, to some of us it represents a lot more than a piece of cloth. You might as well say that's just a piece of parchment. Why have synagogues with Torahs in them? It's just a piece of parchment. Fools. They're fools. An old kid is saying, I'd rather, I'd rather lose to a wise man than win with a fool. It is very tough to deal with fools. Jewish leftists are fools. They mean well. All fools mean well. Mean well doesn't mean a damn thing. It doesn't mean anything. Mean well. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Jew Jewish communists meant well. Non-Jewish communists meant well. Who doesn't mean well? Who wakes up in the morning and says, ooh, I really want to do evil today? <laughs> there are very few such people. So that they, that they are sincere is of no, is of no interest to me. Every bad ideology is filled with sincere people. It's a shame, it's a shame what has happened. Though I, I do remind people, it is not just the Jewish phenomenon. When I see what's happened to mainstream Protestantism and, uh, and non-Orthodox Catholicism, it's, it's, there's no difference. Leftism is a poison. And I've not even mentioned the issue that I have to say may be the one that I am most worried about in many ways. And that is the male-female issue. I pity America's young because of leftism. I pity them. You are the products of child abuse when you are told by teachers that you are not a boy or not a girl, you will decide later what you are.
I can cry for these kids. There are kids now being raised with no gender. No gender. You have a vagina, you will have breasts, you have ovaries, you have a uterus, you have the uh, double X chromosome, but you're not a female. You'll decide one day. Do you know how many schools teachers are told not to call their children? I mean, talking first graders, do not call your students boys and girls. The New York subway has announced you no more of it. No longer are there announcements, ladies and gentlemen, just passengers. We sweet you say health, so you could have said what the hell. It's not funny. It's frightening. I wrote for years for the Jewish Journal when I just had to take a break to write my Torah commentary. And uh, I, I wrote a piece. If you read it, you, it, you, it attacked no one. It was, it was utterly respectful. But I said, you know, the Torah very strongly says that God created the human being male and female. And there's a law in the Torah. Man cannot bear a woman's clothes, and a woman cannot wear that which pertains to a man. The Torah celebrates the differences between the sexes and wants them to be maintained. <coughs> the head of the reform rabbinate called me a hater. They all called me haters. Rabbi after rabbi in non-orthodox life, orthodox rabbis kept silent. They're not particularly strong but they're the only allies I have in Jewish life, so I love them. But uh, courage is not a ubiquitous characteristic in the human species. Orthodox rabbis should be protesting on behalf of the male-female distinction, but they're too busy with other matters. Like this the air of up around LA, which may be important, but it's not as important as maintaining the male-female difference. Okay, Aruf isn't in the total. Just in case you think I only am giving it to non-Orthodox Jews, I just thought I would be fair for a moment and tell you why nobody likes me. But, uh, but this, this issue of the male-female issue, a generation being raised to think this way, the latest study, I don't believe it, but still, the latest study just came out, 3% of American youth do not identify as male or female. If it's true, it's only because society has told them not to. It is exceedingly rare, genuine gender dysphoria. It is exceedingly rare. But listen to this. If you have a 12-year-old and she says, I'm a boy, you can't take that child to a therapist to try to work it out, which in 99% of instances does work itself out. She goes through this phase, but do you know that there are girls now who are getting mastectomies? Under age, under 18, girls getting their breasts lopped off by surgeons because they think they're boys. How does a surgeon do that? And these are the same people who protest the bris. <laughs> Oh, that is so wrong. Foreskin, foreskin removal, that is pagan. But taking a girl's breasts off because she thinks she's a boy, that's progressive. This is the upside down Orwellian world in which we live. And it's all not goes under the framework of leftism. Every rabbi in America should be railing against leftism. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I care if you rail against leftism or not. That is the threat to America. That is the threat to the Jews. That is the threat to Israel, not the right. But that's the way it is. A few final points before I take the questions. Christians. Former head of the Reform Rabbit had announced he would never, he recommends that no reform rabbi in any community attend any of the nights to honor Israel that evangelical churches put on. Now let me tell you, you probably, none of you almost know about these nights to honor Israel. I have had the honor to speak 
at the Christians United for Israel National Convention in Washington many times. I'm going to uh, San Antonio in two weeks for their, that's where it started in San Antonio, Pastor Hagee's church. So I have seen about yeah, I have seen about a dozen of these nights to honor Israel where these Christians get up, sing songs in perfect Hebrew, celebrate the Jews, not just Israel, celebrate the Jews in Jewish history. And the first time I went to it, I, uh, it's a little embarrassing, but I, I will tell you the story. The first time I went, I watched it and all I did was sob. I just kept tearing up. It was overwhelming to me as a Jew to see non-Jews celebrate Jews this way. I had never seen anything. I couldn't imagine it. And I, I, I have in my life three times, only three, ever asked God for anything. The first time I was at about eight years old, I would heard the rabbi say, if you're in trouble, say, Oh God, save me. So I broke an expensive vase in my parents' house. <laughs> locked myself in the upstairs bathroom and said, Anna Adonai. <laughs> Here's the eerie thing. My mother came home and didn't yell at me. It worked. <laughs> I was blown away. The rabbi was right. This is, this is a killer phrase. I gotta, I gotta keep that in mind. But my, my own, why do I call my work the rational Bible? Because I'm very rational and it's very hard for me to ask God for it. I can ask God for others, I don't, I just don't ask for it. But, uh, so the, um, let's see, so there was a second time, oh, what was the example of this? I want to give you the example, oh yes. So the second time was like 40 years later when uh, I was at this uh, night to honor Israel, and I just kept sobbing. And I said, okay, God, I need your help. I can't go up there and just sob. I'll look like an idiot. So, so that was the second time. And the third time uh, was, uh, so that was the third time. The, the, the third time was something personal, and that also worked. Uh, but it's, it's very eerie. But I just want you to understand how deeply I was moved. Now, here's the story. The head of the Reform Rabbinate announced that Reform Rabbis will not attend in any of the communities that have this because we do not share the agenda of these right-wing churches. Okay? So I have an answer. Since you will never attend a, a right-wing night to honor Israel, why don't you make a left-wing night to honor Israel? <laughs> There are no left wing <laughs> It's like trying to go to the ninth floor in an eight floor building. <laughs> it ain't there. There are no left wing church or synagogue nights to honor Israel. So it's a phony, phony line. And anyway, so that's the deal. We Jews, because we're so filled with friends all over the political spectrum, we're going we're gonna to really, forgive me, crap on our Christian friends who honor us, and we will boycott their evenings to, to honor Israel. So this is what I'm told by Jews who want to debunk these spectacular Christian friends we have. They only do it because two reasons. They want to convert Jews, and because they believe that this will bring Jesus back. Because they have apocalyptic views, Israel will go up in flames, and the world will welcome the second coming. Now, I want you to know, I am with Christians as much as I am with Jews. Probably more, actually more. I'm more with Christians than with Jews. I worked for Christians, for evangelicals for 20 years. I, I, I speak in churches of, uh, more than synagogues. Uh, so, uh, I, I know that community really well. Not one ever told me we support Israel because it'll bring Jesus back. <laughs> it, it, by the way, just, it, 
by the way, even to show you how stupid Jews on the left are, not just, not just morally wrong, just stupid. <laughs> Let's say they believe that. Let's say they do believe that the only reason Christians support Israel is to bring Jesus back. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Let's just say it's true. You'll support the Jews till Jesus comes? From a Jewish perspective, it's a good deal. I made that deal, by the way. It's somewhere at the Brandeis Bardeen Institute in their archives, this is actually on video. I am 30 years old, I'm with Jerry Falwell in a dialogue in, in, in uh, Beverly Hills at the, uh, uh, one of the uh, big auditoriums there, and uh, I, I say to the Reverend Falwell, who is the head of it, you know, the leading Christian of, of, of that the moment, he and Billy Graham, and, and so I said, Reverend Falwell, can, can we shake on this deal? You and your followers support Israel and the Jewish people until Jesus comes. And we in turn agree to recognize him when he does. And by the way, you know, none of that was meant as, in any way as disrespectful. I love these people, I adore these people. And, and uh, they're my allies, my friends, so please understand, but, but still, I wanted to make the deal to show Jews how myopic they are. They're so angry at religious Christians who are on the right that they don't even ask what's good for Israel and the Jews. They're just like children. They are. Leftism and childishness are together. I feel, I'm, a little, I'm angry at these people. They don't, they, I don't agree with them on same-sex marriage. So, so okay, so don't agree with them on same-sex marriage. Fine. For that, you, you won't even participate in a night to honor Israel? That's, that's the way they think. This is the state of Jewish life at this time. All right, my friends. I think, uh, I think I covered a lot. Okay. Yeah. Just then for two minutes on this, really two minutes. So what should we be doing? We have a task. The left uses tikkun olam constantly. But, they, but it's a dishonest quotation from the Bible. It's not even in the Bible. It's, dis it's a dishonest quotation from the liturgy. It doesn't say tikkun olam, period. It says tikkun olam mochli shadani. Repair the world under God's rule. That's good. In other words, no God, no, no, no improvement. Yet Jews are the most radically secular of any ethnic group. Jews think that an America that is godless is a good place. That's what they think. But I have a piece that's on the internet. I wrote it many years ago. How I found God in Columbia. And it was the truth. I was very mystified at why my teachers were teaching me nonsense. At such bright people teaching me so much drivel that America was just as culpable as the Soviet Union for the Cold War, that Israel was the villain in the Middle East, that men and women were basically the same. I was learning nonsense by, from bright people. And I give you my word, one day, walking in the big area on 116th and Broadway, all of a sudden, something I had said since kindergarten in yeshiva came into my brain. From the Psalms, wisdom begins with fear of God. And a life-changing, a life-changing moment occurred for Dennis Prager. The reason there is no wisdom in Columbia is that there is no God at Columbia. our task. I don't care if you're an atheist Jew, an agnostic Jew, a believing Jew. Without God, it's all nonsense. 
Only without God can you believe that there's no such thing as male and female. You really, you've really lost the ability to think clearly. This is our task. If Jewish, if all the Jewish professors at universities taught tikkun olam b'malchut shaddai, repair the world under God's rule, America would be in better shape. That's my message. Thank you. questions in the box. Thank you. There were so many of them. When we're done with Q&A, we have a little special treat, so please don't leave. If you can stay. First question is from Mark W. in West Hills. Who's that? Oh! Dennis, red wave or blue wave in November? I'm sorry? Red wave or blue wave in November? Oh, I, I, I never make predictions. I, I only, I know what we have to do. I don't know what will happen. I was sure that Hillary Clinton would win. Never ask me a prediction <laughs> in politics again. And, uh, but I, I, I'm, I think, listen, I hope they believe there will be a blue wave. I hope that the polls keep showing it so that they can become uh, uh, arrogant as they were in the 2016 election. And uh, I, I do say this, you, it, you really do need to get everyone you know if you have to drive them to the polling place. That is your job on election day. Okay, next one from Aaron in Encino, age 23. What is the best way to reach the other side on a massive scale? Well, it depends what the other side is. To reach the left is almost impossible because they won't read us, they won't listen to us, they won't watch us, they won't talk to us. We are happy to talk to them. We, are, we invite people, I'll, I'll never forget, I bumped into Thomas Friedman at the uh, Dulles Airport, the New York Times columnist. And uh, he didn't know who I was, which by the way, in and of itself was revealing. And believe me, this is not ego talking, okay? I, I believe there was a girl who thought I was Phil Jackson, so I, I, uh, I, I don't walk around thinking everybody knows me. But hey, if you're, if you're a columnist in the New York Times and you don't know, let's say, among the five leading conservatives in the country, you're out of it, man! And he's out of it. But it doesn't matter. I didn't care that he didn't know me. But I did say to him, I said, uh, you know, I do a national radio show and I'd love to have you on. He said, oh, that's very sweet of you, but I don't do radio. He was on NPR the next week. <laughs> because NPR will ask him toughies, like, how are you? <laughs> how are things in the Freeman family? <laughs> Why do you think the president is an idiot? <laughs> Why is the New York Times so terrific? <laughs> no, that's what NPR will ask Thomas Friedman. By the way, I don't ask questions to God to get you. I just ask questions to clarify. So, and, and anyone who's known my show, I, I've had big leftists on, the few, the handful that would agree to come on. But here is the point again, on reaching, you can't reach a side that won't allow you to reach them. This is the point. They won't watch our video. They won't read National Review or Town Hall or, or any of the other websites with, with unbelievably intelligent people writing for them. Forget that they won't watch Fox News. $100,000 in security. A yarmulke wearing Orthodox Jew is called a Nazi at birth. Now, is the word sick fair? University of Wyoming I spoke at last year and some, uh, somebody wrote in their, uh, their the Wyoming, uh, U U University of Wyoming newspaper, you know, the usual uh, sexist, intolerant, homophobic, it's not a phobic, racist, bigoted, and, and an anti-Semite. <laughs> you know how many anti-Semites are writing Torah commentaries? <laughs> it's like the new thing among anti-Semites. Wonderful. I'm going to combine these two because they're very similar. We have from Neil. 
and from Eileen. And they asked, what do you think Trump's impact will be on the young vote? And how do you get more young people to vote Republican? What? What was the first one? <laughs> what do you think Trump's impact on oh, the young Trump's vote? impact? I, I have no idea. That, that's not, it's not knowable. Trump is filtered through the, the left. Calls him a Nazi uh, every day. Calls him a white supremacist. I mean, and they believe it. That's the I went on CNN and this was just fascinating. So you may not even recall because the lies of the left, they, they run a, a between a, a four week and six month time period and then they go to the next lie. So this lie was he has massively increased anti-Semitism. He has unleashed anti-Semitism in America. Do you even remember that? This was, a, this was the New York Times, the Washington Post, the CNN, massive. They used as the example a lot of calls to Jewish community centers that were to say that there, there was a bomb there. The death threat, the calls to Jewish community centers. So it turned out, it was discovered just a couple of months later, that 90% of the calls were made by an American Jewish kid who had mental problems living in Israel. The other 10% were made by a black radical who wanted to frame his ex-girlfriend. Not one was made by an anti-Semite, let alone because Donald Trump was elected president. So I went on CNN. I, you could watch it. You should watch it. It's amazing. On Don Lemon's show. And I... Wait, are you booing me or him? I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay. By the way, I'm used to getting booed. Don't even worry about it. So, so I just, I get out there, and it, it was, it was, it was mind-blowing. I, I, none of this stuff bothers me. I have very thick skin. But I, I sit there, half the time, whenever I'm on these programs, it's sort of like entering the twilight zone. I just said, I said, Don, I, you know, CNN and others, it wasn't you alone, not even you, Don, just it wasn't your network alone, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the, the whole mainstream media, I didn't even call them left-wing media. I was polite. All the whole mainstream media said that Donald Trump brought anti-Semitism to the fore as a result of being elected, but it turns out none of this had anything to do with him. And and every other person on the panel said that I was I was making this up. What do you say to that? There's nothing I gave the evidence. I said I'm telling you who called in. It's, it's a make-believe world, so you ask, how will young people react? How will they react to the real Donald Trump? Or how will they react to the filtered Donald Trump, the racist, bigot, misogynist, women groper? And by the way, there's another thing. All the Jewish women who went on these women's marches and then write for the Jewish Journal, it was the greatest day of their life. They cried and they loved it and they brought their daughter with them while they wore a pussy hat. I always, no, no, I always wondered, how did they explain the hat to their daughter? No, I'm not joking. I really, I don't have an answer that's what I, it's what, you know, it's like, yeah, those of you who study Talmud, it's Teku, Tishbi, and Torah, Kushios, and Boyos. When Elijah the prophet comes, he will give us an answer. But until then, I don't have an answer to that. But here's the, but here's the, here's the very serious part. The feminist movement is saturated with anti-Israel hate. Saturated. The feminist movement is coextensive with Israel hatred. With Linda Sarsour and the whole thing. And women go, and Jewish women attend these marches. Okay. Okay, last question from Mitch. Hi, Mitch. Hi. What has impressed you about tonight's event in the Jewish Republican Alliance? <laughs> I did write that. <laughs> just check it, just check it. Detective Prager at work. It really was written and even signed by Mitch. A man who signs his own question is my kind of guy. All right, let me tell you something. Here's my view on the Jewish Republican Alliance and on the, the places that do good work. I say it on the show every day. There, there are two types of people who do good. The ones who do the good and the ones who help the ones who do the good. Not everybody's a fighter, but everybody can help the fighters. These guys are fighters. So if it means joining them,
So listen, folks, uh, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end with this. This, uh, again, I want to thank VBS for making this possible. Uh, it's a very important It's made 90% of this is not, is not joyful. I, 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 my disappointment in many of my fellow American Jews is very deep. And if I didn't care for them, I wouldn't be disappointed. I'm not disappointed in left-wing Protestants. I'm not disappointed in left-wing Catholics. I'm disappointed in left-wing Jews. I expect it better. Not perfect, not great, but not to support the bad guys. That's not Jewish. Thanks for having me.